I think the 50s people didn't even consider themselves a minority group. They didn't even think of disability rights as two words that went together. It was really extraordinary. My vocational rehabilitation counselor came in and talked to me for a while. His recommendation was that I go to a sheltered workshop to spend my life making baskets. There was a belief that if you had a disability, you didn't have any desire to live a life. You didn't have the goals and the dreams that somebody non-disabled had. There were many stereotypes, many myths, and many fears about something different. There were fears about people who weren't, quote, normal. That's a word that I grew up hating because you always heard about the handicapped kids and the normal kids, and they create enormous barriers. Hello, and you're watching another edition of Talk Vietnam. Now, you've just seen extracts from Lives Worth Living, a film by U.S. director Eric Newdell. Now, people living with disabilities are one of the largest minorities in the United States, and this documentary is the first television history recounting these, their struggles for equal rights. Now, the film follows the formation and journey of the disability movements, um, the disability rights movement, and uh, through the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. Um, and now the movement scored one of the biggest uh, civil rights victories in American history and we're very lucky today to have Eric here in our studio to talk more about the film as well as the struggles of the uh, disabilities movement in, um, the, uh, in the United States. Thank you very much Eric for joining us here today. How are you? Um, very well. I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually quite honored to be in Vietnam and able to talk to people here. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk beginning now with your film, um, Lives Worth Living. Um, I was very touched by the extracts, the different scenes, especially uh, the beginning scene uh, with uh, the first character. His name is Fred Fay, mm -hmm. um, and, and the scene of him just on the wheel bed with the mirror trying to control um, his way through life, basically. Um, can you share a little bit more about this particular character? This is um, a fellow who is the inspiration for the film itself. Uh, I had met him by chance at an award ceremony where he was receiving an award. He had lost his speech, so he had to talk just extemporaneously. And uh, he was just magnificent in what he w was talking about. Very philosophical, very powerful speaker. So I decided right at that moment, I have to make a film about this fellow. It took about three seconds. Three seconds yeah. to just make that decision. The, he was that powerful, you know, it was just that meaningful. He was a genius. So he had complete confidence in himself. And it was odd to see somebody who could only move on a wheel bed and had very limited control of his body be so confident about himself and his, his being. It's not just his mind, but his soul. He had control of that. And he understood life in a way that I could see in three seconds, uh, I need to learn from this man. Yeah. After I decided to make a film about him, I started visiting him. And every Thursday, I would go and talk to him. And at first, I thought I'd make a film about his life. Yes. But then I realized he didn't want me to make a film about his life. He wanted me to make a film about what he cared about. And what he cared about was this, at the time, very obscure movement, the disability rights movement yes. in the United States, a movement that people did not pay much attention to at the time, but obviously had this very important result in the United States. It truly changed the landscape of the United States. So I, I wondered about this a lot, because how could something so important be ignored? And I realized it was because people with disabilities had been ignored themselves. One of the points of the film is that you have to have both activism. You have to raise your voice and let people know what you're, what's wrong. And then you have to do something about it. Yes. And what do you do? 
be the change. You make a change and you put it into black and white in law and when the, that law is enforceable, it changes attitudes. Anyhow, Fred Fay, this wonderful man, taught me this and he told me this story during the course of this year that I just talked to him every Thursday and it became clear that I could put these little stories he was telling me together into one coherent uh, beautiful little story about uh, people affecting change, really changing things. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. God bless you all. Having been told for so long how powerless we were and here we were with the President of the United States signing this document that was our Emancipation Proclamation. This fight of ending discrimination in the area of disability is one that will continue to go on for decades. I think the future is the revolution that empowers every single human being on a custom basis. And I think it's the next step for humanity that is necessary to move from the last stages of barbarism into a golden age of science and democracy. We're not going to have science and democracy until each person is empowered to live their God-given potential. And it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen when we make it happen. What was special about this film is that there was no outside narration at all. Um, the whole film was told by the characters themselves, by the 21 characters. Can you tell us about this uh, particular technique that you use in the film? That, that was um, a major point for us from the very beginning in making the film, partially because people with disabilities had had no voice. Yes. In the context of all this opinion that people with disabilities are less than and don't have a voice, don't need a voice, just go right in people's faces with it. Yes. Just go, just you put... You need a film that would give them that voice. Yeah, just give them that voice. So if I had a narrator, if I hired a narrator, it would have been this nameless person who would have uh, given facts and figures and that sort of thing. But there's so much more to be gained by just hearing the voice or seeing the subtlety of people's uh, speech, their ideas, to let them propel the story. But the trick for me was to put these 21 people, at, I tried all 31 in the film, but it was, I couldn't do it, it because it was too many characters. Yes. And I believe you needed to tell a coherent story combining these 21 characters. That's it, that was the hard part, characters. is like, how do I do this? Yes. Because they have to pick up from each other and propel the story along. And the only other unit of change that I had was stock footage, hmm. which was you know, really useful. Uh, but in this, also in this subject area, the mobility issue plays a role. So you can't really film people will, with disabilities in uh, sort of action scenes very much. Yes. Uh, and also this was an intellectual film, so it was mm. all about ideas. So I needed, but I needed action to make the film uh, yes. have this kind of feeling to it that there was, uh, there was something going on and there, there was progression in history. Yes. So I used the stock footage as the action footage, mm. and I used the uh, people commenting on it as the narrator. As the narrator. And that flow uh, made it a gentle film. What are some of the other challenges that you um, encountered during uh, the process of making this film? Well, the, the most important challenge was that nobody believed in it, really. Uh, we got some money and money was always an issue but to do a film like this it requires a lot of stock footage yes. and uh, it's expensive to make a film in general it's expensive to make a film there's travel there's you know hotels we didn't stay in very good hotels but I think the time alone is, is it's a big investment of time I and mean, you spent five years making this film 
Um, so that alone, I believe, is the, the big investment already. Yes, and it, it makes you really poor yes. when you're doing it. I, I knew that this was a good thing to do. It just was good to the bone, and I needed to complete it, especially for Fred, who was very ill during this whole process. And my partner, Allison Gilkey, who's my producer, she saw the meaning of this as well. So we had, um, we had this conviction, this perseverance, that it, no matter what anybody thought, this was important. And that is the hardest part of the whole thing, is just having, to, staying with it, having the perseverance, knowing that what you're doing is important and that it has meaning. Yes. Well, let's talk about your uh, visit here in Vietnam. Now, uh, during his visit here, uh, Mr. Eric Nudal has uh, shown his film, Lives Worth Living, here in the country, as well as he has also had conversations with local people living with disabilities. We'll take a look at that in the following. In the northern province of Thái Nguyen, Eric Newdale and Alison Gilkey have been holding screenings of Vietnamese women with disabilities who are members of the Photo Voice project. Many of them have been involved in social activities, and the film urges them to try harder and be more aware of their rights. Tôi thấy là rất bổ ích cho những người Việt Nam chúng tôi, mà nhất là những cái vùng sâu vùng xa, còn là không được tiếp cận cận với xã hội nhiều. Chẳng hạn như tôi ấy. Tôi chưa được từng đi học nhưng mà tôi cứ tham gia xã hội thì tôi cũng mạnh bạo hơn đấy. Thế còn thì có những người mà tôi thấy là họ sống rất khép kín cho nên là cũng thấy họ thiệt thòi quá so với là những cái gì mà họ đáng được hưởng. The Photo Voice Project is an innovative program that trains people with disabilities in photography and gives them the chance to document their own lives, perhaps even to find employment in the field. According to Bui Dang Thanh, the project's instructor, the film screening has inspired his teammates. Lớp đang đào tạo nhiếp ảnh như thế này, họ họ có được xem cái bộ phim này là một cái tác động rất lớn. Tôi coi như một cái cú hích về mặt tinh thần đối với họ để làm họ thay đổi chính bản thân họ, suy nghĩ chính bản thân họ và họ cũng sẽ có phần một thay đổi cái quan điểm, cái tư duy, cái cái suy nghĩ của các nhà lãnh đạo đối với người của quốc gia này đối với người khuyết tật. Cái bộ phim này nó tác động rất là lớn và đặc biệt là những cái nơi vùng sâu vùng xa, cái những cái vùng mà hạn chế về thông tin, hạn chế về trình độ nhận thức, hạn chế về rất nhiều thứ mà họ được tiếp cận những cái này là cái điều rất là đáng quý. Tears lie in the faces of the attendees today. Perhaps, deep in the minds, the essential message of the film is heading home. This is all about the power of humanity and self-determination, and what one can accomplish against seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Now, Eric, can you share with us, why is it that you have chosen to uh, show lives worth living here in Vietnam? I was invited by the American Film Showcase which uh, is a um, really a wonderful program which brings documentaries from uh, the United States, um, meaningful documentaries to people around the world. It's funded by the State Department of the United States. When they asked me to do it, I said, sure, I'd love to do this because what I want to do is have the biggest possible impact with people around the world, maybe get this idea into people that we're all created equal. And to me, that serves everybody. In terms of uh, kind of some background information in Vietnam here, in tw 2010, the Vietnam National Assembly ratified uh, the law on persons with disabilities. And also on the first day of 2011, this law took effect. Vietnam is trying very hard in order to uh, push the struggle for equal rights for uh, people living with disabilities. But of course, this has its drawbacks as well. Um, and, and that struggle is still going on. Uh, how about other places that you've been um, in the world? Um, do, do you think that this movement is, is going on in, in other parts of the world as well? I, I know it is. And I know that uh, the destiny of this is it's just unstoppable. There, there are going to, people are realizing that this is a very important issue and that it affects uh, so many people in the world. There's almost a billion people in the planet with disabilities. One out of six, seven. Uh, in the United States, it's 60 million people. How can you ignore such a giant minority? And so I know that, that as the world unfolds in its 
uh, movement out of barbarism into yes. a more civilized, uh, compassionate world, which it will do, um, that this is inevitable. We will move toward a better world. And I think people in this world know that they have to do that because it's not possible anymore to survive as a, as a, a planet unless we understand other people in the, in the world and, and until we grant equal rights to people uh, around the world. This is going to be a long struggle, yes. but it will happen, and I see it as inevitable. Any other barriers um, where you, know, you, you see that are evident now um, in U.S. society? There's still barriers when it comes to um, attitudes. Anybody who's had a child with a disability or, or anyone who has a disability, they get it like that. They understand immediately of course. this is important. And uh, this is one of the things that's moved me the most, is seeing the parents of children with disabilities. When, they, when I saw how much they love their child and how much they, that child means to them, and yet that child is being bullied, that's a, that's a problem, a big problem. And people who have disabilities are uh, two and a half times, almost two and a half times, more likely to be bullied Mm. in the American school system, and this has got to change. Well, talking about raising awareness, uh, during his visit, um, Eric Noodle has uh, been able to share his films and also talk to um, uh, students both in uh, Gantou as well as Tai Nguyen about uh, this film, Lives Worth Living. So we'll take a look at his meetings in the following. Tai Nguyen University today welcomes special guest Eric Newdale and his partner, Alison Gilkey who co-directed and produced the PBS documentary, Lives Worth Living. The students were all amazed by the film, which is the first television documentary on the struggle for equal rights by people with disabilities in the U.S., one of the largest minorities in a country that numbers around 60 million people. Em thật sự là rất ấn tượng khi bộ phim có thể gọp được nhiều, nhiều tư liệu như vậy Tại vì nhiều, nhiều hình ảnh em thấy thật sự là rất xa rồi Nhưng mà vẫn có thể tập hợp lại để có thể làm nên một bộ phim rất hay như vậy The film begins in a post-World War II era when the status of people with disabilities began to change rapidly. It ends with a dramatic battle for the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation in America's history. Powerful stock footage haunted the students, but it was the humanitarian aspect of the film that changed the mindsets about disabled communities. Em có thấy khó quên nhất là hình ảnh của một cô bé bò lên cầu thang ấy ạ. Em thấy cô bé đấy có một sức mạnh rất là phi thường, nghĩ là rất phi thường và em rất là khâm phục cô bé ấy. thông điệp này muốn đưa đến người xem là tức là quyền bình đẳng ạ it took five years for Eric and Alison to make the 54 minute film. But that 54 minutes has helped raise awareness among young students about people with disabilities. And to some extent, their efforts have paid off. You've had a great experience meeting with the students in Gantou and Tai Nguyen. What was the message that you wanted to convey with them through, uh, through your talks with them? You can change the world. You can make this world a better place. And you should not settle for this world as it is. It can be made better. And uh, even someone as, uh, you know, along in the years as I am, still has that belief that we can change the world. And uh, I don't want them to ever lose that. I want them to make this world better and to, to you know, see themselves in perspective, to know that uh, real happiness in life comes from helping other people. It doesn't come from gathering things up. For Vietnam, um, even despite these laws that I, I have uh, mentioned in the struggle in itself, um, a sense of uh, discrimination still exists. And, and that is one of the biggest hurdle, um, obstacle to kind of pushing this struggle forward. Um, how about in the United States, the issue of uh, 
discrimination, of um, kind of setting, as you said, looking down on, on, on people living with disabilities and not just seeing them as the people that they are. Um, how is this issue going or what, what is the situation like um, currently? The big push now is for employment. What we've seen is that whenever people with disabilities become part of something, then they just become another person. Like in the, since 1975 in the United States, for example, uh, students were, had to be included, uh, p students with disabilities had to be included with other students. They had to be part of everyday life, mainstreamed within school systems. Yes. Once uh, children who did not have disabilities were with children who did, the differences just disappeared. They've all accepted that disability is part of life. But there's still uh, discrimination mm -hmm. against it. And it's very difficult because dis uh, discrimination is based on ignorance. Yes. It's, it's connected to ignorance, not understanding. So when ignorance is one of these things that is very difficult to break because the people who are ignorant or hold ignorant ideas don't want to do the work. So uh, this process takes a long time, decades, to break people down, but it will break down. And it is breaking down, and that's what I see all over the United States is that this issue, um, especially with films like this, uh, it breaks down the, this ignorance. Yeah. Well, talking about sharing experience with uh, younger filmmakers, um, during his visit here in Vietnam, Eric has also met with a number of filmmakers, um, younger filmmakers here in Vietnam to share his experience of making films. So in the following, we'll take a look at their meetings. And his life. The exchange took place at a U.S. consulate in Ho Chi Minh City. Attendees were mainly independent Vietnamese filmmakers looking to gain experience from their foreign colleagues to improve the local film industry. Cái khó khăn thì thực sự cũng rất là nhiều. Một là khó khăn về cái ý tưởng và đề tài thực hiện. Thứ hai là về cái cái, cái ngân sách để mình thực hiện. Và thứ ba là về giống như là cái sự giúp đỡ của một số cái ban chưa ban ngành lớn khi mà về vấn đề mà mình liên hệ cũng rất khó và tài liệu nữa và những cái tài liệu xưa cũ thì cũng tìm rất là khó. Vấn đề lớn nhất hiện nay là cái cái đầu ra. Ví dụ như khi mà có một cái ý tưởng tốt, khi mà mình có một cái kịch bản tốt, nhưng mà để mình mình tìm một cái 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 mình mình bỏ kinh phí ra mình sản xuất đi, nhưng mà mình tìm một cái đầu ra để mà ví dụ tìm tới nhà đài hay một cái đơn vị nào đó người ta chấp nhận lấy cái phim của mình để người ta phát, đó là một cái cản trở lớn. Eric New Dell was happy to share his 40 years of experience with his Vietnamese colleagues as a documentary filmmaker. What I was trying to do was tell them what a real life experience is in making a documentary like this, that it's really a uh, long, difficult process that you get very tired and it's important to uh, stay with it and believe in yourself because if you have an independent idea, probably nobody else understands it at the time. But that's the thing about ideas, new ideas. It's very important to uh, present new ideas because those are the things that change the world and make the world better. This was Eric Newdow's first time in Vietnam. He came at the invitation of American Film Showcase, a project sponsored by the U.S. State Department that brings award-winning American documentary and independent filmmakers to different parts of the world. It shares films that are very American, but also have themes that are humane and universal. In the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and even Ho Chi Minh said in the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence that all men are cre created equal. Films like this and programs like this help us to talk about values like that that we share between our two countries. For Eric, the trip has helped him to learn more about his colleagues in Vietnam, as well as the landscape of independent filmmaking here. I saw uh, in talking to them this desire this almost emerging world of independent thinking that there are people who crave making their own films and I could see in them that they want to they want to know how to make films outside of uh, the mainstream and to pursue their own ideas their own individual ideas and I, I really saw that today now there are plenty different various 
um, definitions of what a documentary is. What makes a successful um, documentary? Is it good document? No, good story. Good the, story. The, the thing that makes everything, uh, in, uh, the way th I believe the human mind works is that it works in understanding, it understands life through stories. Uh, as I explained to young filmmakers, you have to, in the beginning, make a promise to your viewers that you, that you will uh, surprise them and then you must surprise them and then you in, in the end you must pay off you must make sure that they're coming away with a feeling some feeling uh, a sense of completion they've seen something and they really understand what they've seen and that's a very uh, very important part of it is to make something cohesive that fits together and stories stories are the key Yes. If, uh, I think what, what is difficult is that how do you know if, if you know you have the right story? You feel it. You, you, there's no problem with that. You feel, you feel it. If you don't have that part of yourself, you probably shouldn't do documentaries. In terms of the technique of making um, documentary films, are there certain um, trends and, and styles now in, in the current um, wave of making documentary films in the U.S. that um, filmmakers here in Vietnam should be aware of? Now you have uh, sort of the cult of personality. So people are following personalities as uh, a documentary form. Yes. They're also, uh, separate from that, they're also following issues. So there might be something that's very heavily narrated, but following an issue, uh, which can only be covered really in narration. Or there may be another film, uh, I think these are the two styles that are dominant right now, where you have a great character, someone has a lot to say and yes. to deliver, and you follow that person. Mm. And through identification with that person, uh, you develop those attitudes yourself. You mm. see through mm. things into that attitude. Uh, so those are the two forms I see right now. There are, you know, there are many forms, nicely for documentaries, many of the different ideas about how to do documentaries have been developed. Yes. So it's really a wonderful uh, art form now. How do you keep yourself inspired over the years? I think it's the, um, the feeling that there's so much to do, there's so much in the world that, could, that needs to change, and. Um, there's there's so much uh, knowledge on one hand and so much ignorance on the other mm -hmm. and uh, I'm pretty passionate about breaking down this ignorance I don't think I could ever get tired of it uh, I think that's my nature to really enjoy people and to really be learning from them all the time right. so it's easy to be inspired because people are so inspiring Eric Newdale has been an editor in three out of the 13 episodes of Vietnam, a television history, a production by the Public Broadcasting Service, or PPS, in the early 1980s. The series is considered the best television documentary that American filmmakers have ever made about the Vietnam War. Vietnam, a television history, won six Emmys, plus many other prestigious awards. But we didn't go in there with the uh, express purpose uh, that this is a wonderful opportunity to show how uh, great our weapons are and how much destructive power they possess. Uh, as a result of their being so entrenched, it required for us to, to bring maximum firepower at our disposal to eliminate them. fortunate in that we did have the weapons that were capable of, of rooting the uh, NVA and the Viet Cong out of their positions. For us, you know, strategy is never purely military. Our strategy is always a general, an integrated strategy, simultaneously military, political, and diplomatic. Thus, the Tet Offensive of 1968 obviously had an objective that was both military and political. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement in the series um, as an editor? When I joined the production, there was, um, I think, six editing rooms. Uh, there were three teams of people. There was a British team, a French team, and an American team. And the American team was kind of like you had people on one side of the political spectrum, and, and yes. then you had people Democrat, on the other. Yeah, you had the completely opposite opinions about this war. I think that more than any other series in my life, more any other thing I worked on, that shaped the way I thought about things. It was a very perplexing. So my opinions about the war uh, changed as I became more, as I said earlier, like neutral. Um, or reaching as I became, much as possible. I went into a limbo with this. Uh, I wasn't American. I wasn't Vietnamese. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, who I was, but I floated around with all the ideas of what happened. You asked me what haunts me earlier. Well, this is something that haunts me. I saw something very tragic in the decisions that had been made. I felt like I lived within that war for three years and that the things I was seeing on the screen and uh, asked to make sense of were changing me. That had a big effect on my life. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat sometimes. Mm. Uh, it was very haunting to go through this and it was always debating well, what really happened here. Well that made me a better journalist. You mentioned once that there was a sense of sadness that overwhelmed you at the end of your three years. Can you elaborate on that? Well it's never left me. I've never I felt sad about that war um, since that time. I mean I was sad about it before but I was angry. Um, Why so? Well, because I thought they were asking young men to go fight. Uh, there were two very different sides to this war. Uh, in the Vietnamese side, there was a national purpose. There had been uh, colonial rule for a long time, and people in Vietnam, I think, wanted... Independence. Yeah, they wanted, just like the United, in the United States, when we were uh, a young country, or not even a country, we wanted our independence. We wanted to determine for ourselves where our nation was going. We wanted to make our own laws. We wanted to live, well, for better or worse, we wanted to live as we are, as a people in the United States. Well, I thought of Vietnam as a country that had the same right to determine its, its future. This was the post-colonial era. I felt that in the United States, people were asking us to go fight for an abstraction, some kind yes. of idea that was an abstraction. But for the Vietnamese people, it wasn't an abstraction. It was real life. It was a real purpose. Yeah. And so you could see those two things very obviously playing out in the war itself. Yes. That you had a very dedicated group of people who really believed in what they were doing and were willing to withstand a tremendous amount of bombing and um, war, a lot of losses. Um, and then on the other side, you had, you know, 58,000 American soldiers who lost their lives, and then uh, how many wounded, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand wounded from this, a uh, total force of almost a half a million at one point. And um, I thought, wow, there's so much to do in this world. There's so much the United States could do in this world, being the superpower that it is. Why are we not doing that? Why yes. are we doing this? So in reviewing the war, these feelings came up again. I don't think uh, the people who conducted this war understood the nature of Vietnam. And that's what made me really sad. Yes. strategists plan to use firepower to break the will of the enemy and make them talk peace on America's terms. 
It brought to bear the power of its industry and technology, and also its young men. What really began to happen after a, after a few months was that you begin, you could get as far as understanding that this was crazy. What was going on here was nuts. But you didn't dare begin to draw conclusions from that because they pointed in directions that were just terrifying. I mean, America might not be the, the guys on the white horses with the white hats. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be in Vietnam. Maybe I've gotten my ass out here in the bushes for nothing. You can't think about that kind of stuff in a situation like that. For instance, it never occurred to me to quit. I laid down my rifle and said, I'm not going to do this. Somewhere lurking in the back of my mind was 20 years of making big rocks into little rocks. I knew when I went to Vietnam that I had to be there for 395 days. And if I was still alive when I got to the end of those 395 days, I could go home and forget the whole thing. In terms of the technical um, aspects of the film, this is, um, it's a series that, that required, as we said, a tremendous work, um, and it goes down to the very details. Um, let's take the, the sound, for example. Everything um, was, was very um, meticulous. Can you share with us uh, these small details that made up the, um, the, the end success of the film? Well, one of the things that uh, I, I learned during this time and was really important about that series was that every, if we did something, it had to be completely accurate. So if we had, a lot of times you get footage and it doesn't have any soundtrack. It was just recorded silent. Yes. Or the soundtrack had been lost in some form. So what we would do is, uh, you know, we'd replace the bullets, the sound of the bullets, the tanks, the... Uh, vehicles that people used. Uh, but if we saw something on the screen, it had to be exactly, if we did a sound for that, it had to be exactly that machine, mm -hmm. exactly that gun, exactly that bullet, exactly, uh, you know, if it was a 50 millimeter uh, Browning machine gun, we had to have a 50 millimeter Browning machine gun firing. There could be no leeway in this. Very meticulous. It was incredibly tedious. Uh, every single detail that anybody said, anybody, even every word was analyzed to see if it was accurate. If there was a figure that was put out, it was, it had to be accurate. Yes. Uh, because we knew we were in dangerous territory. We were uh, in a nation divided that this country, uh, America was very split still about that war. Uh, and that the toll be of this has played out in the United States in a way maybe Vietnamese people don't understand, but it has had a profound impact on American life and um, on, on the people who participated in that war. So w when we were doing it, we knew we were in, in difficult territory. We knew we had to be accurate, and we knew almost unassailable because there were plenty of people that were going to attack us from the left, from the right. We were going to get it. Yes, so but there needed to be, you know, as best, the, the best accuracy that you can possibly achieve, even if it meant going down to the sound of a single bullet. So this accuracy was our saving grace. This is what takes the argument away. Yes. This is uh, perfectly accurate. You cannot argue with what is accurate. Do you think that accuracy is what is, is the main factor that makes up the success of the movie in the yes, end? Yes, I do. I think in every great documentary, it is accurate. And it is, uh, there's a commitment to accuracy that uh, makes the difference. I said this was the first time a series had been done like that. That was one of the distinguishing characteristics of it. It was accurate, beyond belief. <laughs>
in the future? Do you have any future plans uh, that perhaps may include Vietnam? Oh, yeah. I would love to do something about the cost of this war in Vietnam, the real cost of war. Yes. Okay, so it costs us a certain amount of money to uh, conduct the war. There's a tremendous amount of cost afterward. Um, there's people that need to rehab. Yes, post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. There, there's in the United States the, the people, the young men, and especially the young men who uh, were soldiers in this war and may not have understood exactly what was happening to them. The, uh, there's tens of thousands of them that have suffered from that war and have had difficulty living productive lives. So I think that kind of cost is worth covering. Yes. And I think the cost here is yes. worth covering. Agent Orange, unexploded ordinance, people living um, traumatized still because they lost so many families. Um, and, and I'm sure the same in the U.S. as well. I mean, there are um, veterans who are living with the effects of Agent Orange passed down to their children, Absolutely. just like here in Vietnam. Yes. yes, and I'd like to cover that. And, uh, uh, you know, but what I need to do is, is to do the same thing I did with Lives Worth Living and find the story, find a central character uh, that can teach me this story. What makes you most proud in your entire career since 1971 um, of being a filmmaker? Well, I think a lot about how I started out. I was uh, sort of, I came from a very poor family and, uh, you know, I had... Um, I don't think anybody expected that I would be doing this. You know, I think I always wanted to be doing something important, but I didn't want the normal things people were pursuing. I didn't want to join in the society as just someone pursuing wealth. I wanted to, I thought there was something maybe more meaningful to do. So I was not an ambitious person. And I was very willing to take a job as a janitor in a television station. And the people who worked in the television station noticed that I was not ambitious and therefore I was not a threat. So they kept promoting me. And that's how I got the, into the filmmaking part of my life. I went first from a janitor into a newsroom librarian and then into an, a sound recordist for, uh, you know, I worked as many of the people around this studio work. I worked uh, as a cameraman on many productions, and I learned the craft. I felt like um, I had to have faith, and uh, I had to have faith that my life would go in a certain way, um, and that even if I rejected standard uh, definitions of success, that somehow my life would go where my heart was going, and that that was really worth following. That was wor really worth doing something about. And uh, that's what I did. I followed my heart yes. and I'm proud of doing that more than anything else. I'm proud of that. I felt like I never really wandered that far away from myself. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for sharing your passion of uh, documentary, your passion of changing the world. Um, I believe it, it, it's inspiring to me. Um, as a young person pursuing television and broadcast and news, um, but also I'm sure very inspiring to other young people out there, either wanting to be a filmmaker or wanting to be um, a positive change to, to the society that they're living in. Well, thank you very much for having me on this show. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you very much. And that wraps up our edition of Talk Vietnam this time with U.S. filmmaker Eric Nudel. We hope that you have been inspired by the films that he has brought to Vietnam this time and uh, that you yourself have enjoyed this edition. Thank you very much and we'll see you more next time here on Talk Vietnam.